Hey, what's up, Banff? So we are here today with the man, the myth, the legend, Sean Ellis of growthhackers.com. Many of you know him, probably everybody in this group knows him by now. And he has uh, done some of the most famous case studies, especially Dropbox, which we talked about recently with the whole um, Loom case study that we went over. And I wanna dive into a lot of what he's doing today. And he has taken a bit of his time to be with us today. One is because he loves the community, and he wants to give some of his knowledge with growth hacking, growthhackers.com, back to you guys. And thank you for being here. Thanks, Josh, good to be here. So if you could talk a little bit about your background and just give a quick brief intro to some of the people who may not know who you are. Yeah, for sure. So I, I've been kind of started marketing on the internet basically as, a, as it was launching. So um, like 1996 and uh, at the time, there was no book on, on how to market on the internet. So basically just, uh, just figuring out as we went. And um, you know, I, I think for, for a lot of it, this, this kind of led into everything that I'm even doing today. We, we were a lightly funded uh, startup out of Eastern Europe and um, they essentially competing against some of the most well-funded companies out there. Um, Yahoo, Sony, um, Sony was the number one advertiser, but we were in the online game space, a company called uproar.com. And uh, it, was, it was something that I, I originally actually started in a sales position, but we didn't have anybody on the, um, on the site. So I basically, basically said, you know, if I'm gonna ever sell advertising, we're gonna need people. So I took on the, the, the marketing role and again, just sort of figured it out as I went, but um, started with, well, obviously you can track really well here. And it was because I, I didn't have any marketing background, so I just sort of looked at the medium and thought, what, how should you approach marketing on this medium? So first of all, if you can track everything, you should track everything. Then I got into, well, if you can track and then you can test different things, you should test everything. So really early, I, I, I probably had better tracking that we set up. Part of it was because we could compete against, uh, we, or we had, um, really talented developers that were a lot more affordable than uh, the US developers. So Eastern European, super creative developers. And uh, basically, basically just figured out a lot of stuff and, and you know, fast forward, cause I could talk for the next two hours on that experience, but fast forward, we became the number uh, eight website in the world in terms of total usage time. Um, so unique users times average time per user, which obviously is really important for an advertising supported business. Um, we invented probably the first um, embeddable widget strategy. So kind of, uh, kind of the, the YouTube or SlideShare strategy, that's how we grew. We, we, instead of trying to compete just buying ads, we decided to take our gameplay experience, make it embeddable on third-party sites, start the gameplay experience there, draw people in and um, just, yeah, I mean, I, I think we just were out of box thinking because we, we didn't know what the box was supposed to look like. And so it was, it was sort of just the perfect perfect time uh, to, to kind of invent what internet marketing should be. And then that company went public, sold, we, we, we ended up selling that company after it went public and uh, same group of people started log me in a couple, or maybe a year later, maybe a couple of years later, I don't remember exactly what the timeline was, but um, log me in was one of the first, it was probably the first freemium SaaS business. So um, again, it, it's sort of everything that we did was always in response to competitors. So Go to my PC um, was spending a ton of money on on advertising to, to grow their business, and so to disrupt them, we decided, you know, we, we would need to have a different approach. So that's where we 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 just again, it was all about leveraging the unique advantages of the internet, and so you know, creating software that that could spread on the internet. It's not like you have a big marginal cost on the software, especially uh, we are, again talented Eastern European developers got our, our cost way down so we could give away a free version of it. Um, today, you know, again, fast forward today, LogMeIn's a six billion plus dollar business. And, um, and probably one of the biggest things that I learned with LogMeIn that I hadn't learned previously at Uproar was how important the full customer journey optimization was to make customer acquisition channels work. So um, we, we were having a really hard time growing that business we figured out if we, if we could test a lot around that first customer journey, we could probably improve the number of people who actually got a good experience with the product. Again, I could talk a long time on that, but, but got a, uh, a big boost on sign up to usage rate, which led to a lot more purchases, which led to a lot more 
uh, that we could spend on acquiring customers. And, um, and then, so kind of when I, when I finished with that, I was like, gosh, this has got to be the luckiest streak. Two, two IPOs over, over about a 10 year period with these two companies and um, try to really figure out why, why was, why did that happen? Was it just luck or was there some things that we did that were, were unique and, and different? And that's when I um, decided I was going to, uh, to I, or I, first I looked and saw that the, um, probably the most important stuff that we did in both those companies was kind of the first six months of go to market. Mm-hmm. And so I thought if I can, if I can focus on that, you know, if, if that's the most important time, I, I spent 10 years and only have maybe a year of super relevant experience on the time that matters. So that's where basically for the next few years, I just did these like short term interim uh, six month roles of helping companies come to market. That's, that's when I worked with uh, Dropbox and uh, Eventbrite and Lookout and um, just some companies that all did really well, but it was, um, it was about trying to get experience to set things up, up right because like once, once sort of cultural norms and other things kick in in a business, it's really hard to, really hard to, to change how growth is done. So I was trying to get it set up right. And now fast forward to where I am now, I, I'm, I'm actually, even though I just said, it's really hard to get it done with bigger businesses. That's the, that's the uh, challenge I'm trying to tackle now. So um, it's a very frustrating challenge, but um, when you can, when you can get an early or when you can get a later stage business to actually rethink how they should approach growth and, and just, just growth in general, it's, it, you can you can drive massive massive like growth trajectory change when you can get people out of the habit of marketing brings people in the front door product keeps people but when you can start to say gosh the first user experience is the most important which I learned at at, uh, at log me in but also learned at Dropbox a lot like reinforce that thinking whose responsibility is the first customer experience with the product is that marketing is that product in most companies it's nobody so. Being able to really become more customer centric, thinking of the full customer journey, that the key metric of, of customer value, customer value drives word of mouth, customer value drives retention. Like there's, there's just a whole different way to think about growth that most larger companies aren't thinking about, but the breakout fast growing companies have, have that baked into their DNA from the beginning. So that's, that's the challenge that I'm really tackling now with, with growth hackers. So one of the things I want to talk to you about, which you had mentioned, is the customer journey. Now, um, after my experience at Autopilot, I learned that not a lot of people know what a customer journey is. Yeah. And it's only maybe in the last three years that it's become really popular, even though it's existed for a good amount of time. Sure. And would you say that it's the growth marketers who are really pushing the customer journey forward and getting people to know, understand more about it and educate people on it? Because as you said, when people you know, jump into the product, that you have, is it the marketer's job? You know, whose job is it to give them that experience, right, yeah, yeah. of the customer journey? I think, I think that's how I stumbled into it, and I and I think that happens a lot. That, you know, there's there's a lot of marketers that basically say my responsibility is customer acquisition, and I I need to find creative ways to get people in the front door and just accept whatever the heck happens after that. And mm-hmm. the where, but I think that there's some some marketers that that don't accept like status quo as good enough. And, and that they basically say, what the hell is making my job so hard? What truly is holding back growth? And when, you know, it's pretty easy to just look at the funnel and say, oh my God, we're losing 60% of the people at this step. Why are we losing those people? They're the wrong people um, or they're the right people and they're just not getting it. And when you start to, to look at, at kind of each step that the customer takes to get value in a product, that's when you start to say, gosh, if I, could, if I could fix that stuff, marketing will become a lot easier. So I think it's the, the marketers who tend to be metrics driven and tend to, tend to essentially get the frustration of not being able to drive a steeper growth curve. And analysis reveals that like, it's, it's less about just being able to bring people top of funnel and, and more about this interdependency of every step of that customer journey that prevents your ability to grow. And so, yeah, I think good marketers are recognizing that that's where the problem is. Unfortunately, most can't really do anything about it because it's, you know, ultimately you realize that you got broken parts of that customer journey. And if as a marketer, you go to the product team and you say, 
you, guys, you got to get that first experience right and maybe test some variations there. You just haven't nailed it. The answer for most product teams is stop bringing in crappy people. <laughs> you know, like it, it, it's, you get this like silo pointing back and forth where, you know, ultimately, and that, I think that's really the power of this concept of North Star metric. If you're, if you're familiar with that, that like a North Star metric essentially being that quantified customer value. So how much, how much, if, if you could essentially say, what is, the, what is the footprint of value that we've created across an entire customer base? And, and so that footprint shrinks every time someone leaves a service. Like if, let's say you're a SaaS service. Every time someone stops using it, the footprint shrinks a little bit. Every time you add someone new to it, the footprint grows a little bit, but that ultimately, you know, and then anytime you get existing customers to use twice as much or get twice as much value, it grows. And so if you can quantify that, and you can make a mission for the whole business to grow value, that's when the magic happens. That's what Facebook does. That's what Airbnb does. That's what Uber does. And that's ultimately, and this was Dropbox, Spotify, you know, just go down the list of all the breakout growth companies. And I think that's what, that's what gets different groups working together is when you define a shared mission of, of growing value to customers and where you understand where you're losing that value, suddenly, suddenly that becomes an opportunity where everyone can pull together and, and work on that. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's the biggest thing that holds growth back for most companies. And, and um, in an early stage startup, so when I started with Dropbox, there was less than 10 people. It was not that hard. You know, it wasn't like I had a battle big siloed, <laughs> or a big siloed organization. It was basically all engineers and me. So like, <laughs> I basically just, I went to the CEO, an engineer and said, all right, here's, I've, I've analyzed all the customers, how they're coming in, run a bunch of surveys to learn what they're looking for, where they're having problems. And here's some experiments that I would like to run to try to improve that customer experience. And let's, if you could please work with me to go to the uh, engineers to launch these first few exper experiments, that'd be great. Let's just start with the first few. And then it was really quick before the engineers, you know, not, not much time before the engineers looked and said, okay, that makes sense. You test stuff, you improve results. You test more, you improve more. And they're math people. Like most engineers can figure that out and they're also problem solvers. So if you can kind of couch we're losing 80% of the people at this step or whatever it is, then, then they can look at it and they can start thinking of solutions to improve that math problem. Um, that's, that's really cool when you start to see that. And, and interestingly, when I interviewed the head of uh, worldwide marketing at Dropbox a couple months ago at the Growth Hackers Conference, one of the things she said that really stood out to me was, what's unique about Dropbox is that everyone in the entire company takes ownership of growth. And I think that's, that really started in those early days. That was, that was the stated objective that I had with Drew when I joined Dropbox was in this six month interim role, let's, let's try to make a culture of growth and experimentation is what we called it. And after I left, it was another um, probably nine months before the next marketer joined the company. Wow. And uh, no, or growth person. And um, that experimentation didn't slow down at all. The engineers conceptualized, prioritized, launched, they just, the whole culture of that business changed and, and, you know, and based on the interview from a couple months ago, it's, it's like persisted all the way through. And I think that's, that's what companies should be trying to do. And that's hard. So one of the things that you had mentioned earlier is that the foundation has to be set in the early stages of the company because then the culture sets in habits are mm -hmm. hard to remove. Yeah. And one of the things that I've seen is a lot of companies, they focus on, they say, Hey, you know, you're the marketer, your KPI is how many leads you generate for us. Right. You know? focus on retention or anything like that. And then the marketer is scared to bring up retention, all those, these other experiments that they want to run to really optimize the customer journey. Right. So they're afraid of job security, right? They want to keep their job. And if they start running some tests and the first couple don't work out, yeah. um, you know, they can get removed from their job. Yeah. So you sort of have to get everybody on board. And I'd love for you to talk about, you know, how could a marketer who's maybe in a 20 person company, 40 person company, get the rest of their team on board to understand this customer journey so they yeah. can really optimize it before they scale. So that's, that, I think you really nailed it with the, um, they're scared. Like that's, that is, that, that's a reality. And it's something that if you want to be good at growth, if you want to be really good at, at 
you know, marketing is just a piece of growth. And so um, if you want to be really good at growing a business through marketing or whatever means you can, you, you gotta, you gotta have guts and you gotta do scary things. And I think that's why a lot of, of good growth and marketing people turn out to be entrepreneurs because it's the same sort of thing that causes you to launch a company is, is that, that take on those big challenges. And, um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's where I, I think the starting point is like, it's gotta be driven from the CEO, a CEO who's not growth oriented. Um, it's really hard to build that, that culture in the business of the CEO is not growth oriented. But if you, if you think about it, like a CEO founder of a business usually starts out with this idea of a need that's unmet and that's why they're launching the business. And so ideally they're going to be pretty growth oriented that they basically say, okay, if we can get an elegant solution to that problem, that's step one of the battle. That's not, that's not the end of the battle. The battle is now how do we actually make impact on that problem? Impact is based on how many people are reached with that solution. And so I think what, what you see, and again, and it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's that exactly as you said, in an early stage company, it's so much easier to do everything right. And so what you see is that the, the best companies, the CEO starts by talking a lot about mission, which seems totally touchy feely to me. Like when I, <laughs> when I, like I, I would not have thought mission was all that important, but mission, mission is kind of like, what, what are we doing here? What is, what is, what is the, not the meaning of life, but the, the meaning of work life anyway. Like, are we just, are we just, you know, moving numbers? Or are we actually trying to trying to make an impact on people in an area that we think we're uniquely capable of doing that? And if you can kind of take that mission down, and, and I think Facebook's like the, the best at all of this. Uh, I read an article in Fortune probably, it's, it's from a few years ago, but I only read it maybe four or five months ago that, that talked about Mark Zuckerberg finds a way to get the company mission into every sentence inside the company or outside the company like once or twice or every conversation once or twice. And so he's, he's constantly reinforcing that mission. And they're also the company that first, I first heard talk about the, the concept of a North Star metric. So North Star metric it's, is then just sort of like quantified progress against that mission. And so that's, it's, it's breaking down those sort of like, okay, marketers bring in leads. But instead it's like, we as a team are trying to make impact. This is the metric we're trying to move what's the thing that's holding us back from moving that? And sometimes you've got to kind of break out of your silos and, and talk about that first customer journey. That's the part that's most broken. And I think to me, when you, when you define that shared mission, when you quantify that shared mission, it becomes a lot easier for everyone in the company to start pulling in the same direction. So question would be for well-established companies that understand their customer acquisition channels, does your North Star metric get pushed back into the funnel saying, how many of our customers are referring more customers now? What do you say that that happens for more established companies that they should be pushing it back or maybe keeping it front as well, depending? I think, I think referral is, is a variable that increases your North Star metric. It's not a North Star metric by itself. So it's really, you know, if you, if you, if you really think like, so for, for Facebook, their North Star metric is daily active users. And so if you think, how do I grow daily active users? If I can drive more referrals, that's an awesome way to drive more daily active users. If I can retain more customers, that's an awesome way to not lose daily active users. If I can drive more people top of funnel through really cost-effective spending, that's also an effective way to grow it. So it's okay to spend money to do it, but you know, if I, if I get, I mean, I think that, that, that's really the beauty if you actually go through the kind of Facebook case study, when does a new user become a daily active user. What's, what's the barrier of a new user becoming a daily active user? It's not when they just sign up for the service because they got zero value if they signed up for the service. You know, if they just, if they just created a profile, why are they gonna come back? You know, there, there, there's no reason they come back and read their own profile, no. So it's really not until they actually connect with someone and look at someone else's profile that they get a little taste of value of the service. But if they come back the next day, it's actually gonna be the same profile. Like it's very unlikely that, that that one person made an update. So they're they're unlikely to come back a second day. Or if they come back, they're not gonna come back a third day. And so Facebook was able to realize that it actually takes uh, about seven friends 
before, before you actually start to see enough updates in your feed from your connections that you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this thing regularly. And so what they, and then the other thing they realize, like let's say it takes, you know, five years to get to those seven friends, most people will have given up on the service at that point. So they, there's like a time period and a tipping point that needs to happen. And so it's kind of time to value. Every, every product has a time to value that people give up on it if they don't get value fast enough. Facebook's probably harder than most businesses, yet it's one of the most valuable businesses on the planet because they figured out that they need to get seven people, or they need people to get to seven friends in 10 days if they don't get them there by 10 days, they're gonna lose them. So during those first 10 days, they're not showing necessarily a ton of ads to those people and trying to monetize them so much. They're much more likely to show people you may know. Once I have a couple of connections, I'm more likely to wanna to, you know, then, then they have some data to work off where they can start to show me other connections. And once they have those seven friends, now they're much more likely to be a long-term retained user, in which case now I can start focusing on monetization. But every, every business has that same kind of activation step that, again, historically has always sat in no man's land between marketing and product. Marketing didn't have the authority to run those types of experiments to improve that first user experience. And product, especially very customer oriented product, they're talking to existing customers and figuring out how to extend the product roadmap to make it even more awesome. But then you've got this like gap where everybody's falling in between. And so I think that's, that's the, you know, the, the, the starting point anyway. I think that's so interesting what you said that based on their attention likelihood to stay with the app, uh, they'll determine how, how many ads they should show you, right? Yeah. And I'd never thought about it that way, so I think that's really fascinating. Because I always just thought, you know, they show maybe the same amount of ads to everybody in some regards. Yeah, and I think it's just having that clarity of objective and, and that the initial objective should be to convert someone to a passionate customer. And if you can do that, then, then it's, you know, for a long time, everybody's talked about, you know, a customer retained is, is much more valuable than a customer acquired, but they didn't necessarily talk about how. And so, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it, it is true that a retained customer is, is really important, but what drives retention, value drives retention. So if you don't get them to value fast enough, you're not gonna be able to retain them. And, that, and so to me, activation, if you, if you take the full funnel, activation, I would say, is, is the most important step. And if you look at the fastest growing uh, apps out there, I don't think there's ever been an official study on it, but it kind of, from everything that I've heard, about 50% of the product development resources in the fast growing consumer apps go into that first customer experience. Wow. Rapid iteration on that first customer experience, which makes sense, right? There's no second customer experience if you don't nail the first one, but most, most companies don't put 1% into, <laughs> into optimizing the first customer experience. Wow, that's so interesting to hear. Um, one of the things I really want to dive into is what you're doing now with growthhackers.com, the software that you have. And you know, first of all, how did it come about? Um, I'd love to hear that story too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been somewhat of an iterative process in how the software came about. Growth Hackers itself actually, you know, when I was going through my bio, I kind of got stuck on some points and skimmed over other points. So one of the, one of the points I skimmed over was that we used to own a product called Qualaroo. And um, what I had realized was like our whole growth engine was around um, people experiencing the product and then they would sign up for the product. So it was a survey unit that pops up on websites and has a little powered by Qualaroo or we tested a lot of messaging on there. I think the latest is, uh, have you tried Qualaroo? But, but ultimately people would answer a survey question with this and then, you know, and it was seen by billions of people and so, not surprisingly, a marketer sees it and says, well, I should run that question on my site. And, and so it, it spread that way. But also not surprisingly, if you run it on Nickelodeon, your you know, kind of survey question to conversion sign up is almost nothing because it's a bunch of 13 year olds, you know? So um, increasingly we found we, uh, like a much higher uh, and a response to, to sign up conversion rate if we ran on marketing sites. And then I looked around and saw that there really wasn't very many good marketing sites. Most of the marketing sites I was seeing out there were um, written by journalists 
journalists writing about marketing rather than marketers writing about marketing. And so that's where I thought, okay, there's a great opportunity to actually launch launch content aggregation of marketers writing about marketing and other marketers talking about that, and which became growthhackers.com. And then if we can uh, you know, run lots of Qualaroo surveys on that site, that will be probably the most cost-effective way for us to acquire a lot more people with Qualaroo. And so that, that business probably, probably 10X'd in, in a couple of years. We sold that business to focus on growth hackers. And you know, increasingly, as I engaged with more and more marketers and, and growth people, I, I realized that um, this challenge that I talk about, that very few people understand the interdependency of each step in the customer journey. Uh, you know, you're not gonna be able to retain people if you can't effectively activate them. You're not gonna be able to acquire people if you can't retain them. You're not gonna drive referral if you don't bring value. Like all of these things work off of each other and so you have to think about it holistically. The problem is that much of that customer journey, as I said before, is crossing customer support, marketing, I mean, it starts with marketing, customer support, B2B, sales is in there somewhere, maybe some customer success, you got product, engineering's touching it. Yeah, like you just have all these different groups that just aren't coordinated around that. And so that was, that was my vision of like, how do, you, how do you actually shine a light on the biggest opportunities to accelerate growth, rally the team to actually experiment and work together, problem solve in those opportunities and if, if you can do that and, and actually help to transform, especially in bigger companies, you, you can really help to accelerate growth much more effectively than just trying to pour more resources in channels that are increasingly hard to compete in anyway. So that, that's, that's where we got here. And I'll be honest, it's, it's hard. Like a software business is hard. So we, we have some really good customers on the product, but it's, it's a slog to, to kind of communicate to people um, what's needed and, uh, and why the software is an important component of what's needed, uh, but we're, we're getting better at it. So, and then the other thing that's kind of interesting is that even though our focus is really trying to help the larger companies become much more effective around growth, just because there's so much value being left on the table by them, the smaller companies should be setting up right in the first place. And so that's where we made the product. It's called North Star. We made it free for companies that are much smaller. And then, um, you know, even sub 100, it's significantly more affordable than once you get over 100 employees. You really need software like this to be able to, to significantly accelerate growth. And so that's where we spend the majority of our sales effort on the bigger than 100 companies but um, we make it super affordable and accessible under 100. Yeah, that's awesome, especially because there's so many young companies out there that may have data and they just need to optimize a little bit more. Yeah. But you also have on the other hand, which you know, I'd love to hear your opinion, is a company and a founder and maybe someone who's like their head of growth, they understand everything you're talking about, but in order to get those data points so they can optimize, it's going to cost them money, Yeah. right? So whether that's Google AdWords, running Facebook ads, or even content marketing to get to the next level. Right, so, so yeah, to get the flow. I mean, interesting on the data itself, there's, there's so many like super affordable tools and even free tools out there between like Google Optimize being free, Amplitude free up to 10 million user events per month. So like the data and testing tools themselves are super accessible, especially to smaller businesses for, for free or for pretty cheap and then uh, and then, yeah, but you do need you do need some level of customer flow coming through, and so I think that's where the creativity kicks in. And I started to, to talk about that before that um, you know a lot of my aha around this happened at um, at Log Me In, and we I basically came out of the gate really operating Log Me In as a VP of marketing that was very channel focused and went out, started trying to build channels and just hit the wall because we had such a crappy first user experience that I could, I could bring in a thousand people a day like signing up for the product for, for like $10,000 a month. So I was bringing them in at a really affordable level, but then 95% of the people were signing up and never using the product once. And I, how, do you, how do you get a return on investment with with that kind of a situation and so that's where that's where you know when i got i had a ceo we'd raise all this venture capital i have the ceo who's pushing me to spend a hundred thousand dollars a month at least 
and I know if I spend even 11,000, I'm gonna lose the last thousand dollars. Like I'm just, I'm just stuck, I've done all this testing. And so it wasn't until I went back to him and just said, you know, we're, we're spending all this money, but we're not really creating customer value. I'm not getting return on investment. Let's, let's try to figure out this first customer experience. And to his credit, I didn't expect him to do this. He literally put a complete freeze on the product development roadmap and said, every single person on the product and engineering team is gonna focus on the first customer experience for the foreseeable future. Told me, stop trying to develop channels. Everyone in marketing is gonna focus on the first customer experience. We were able to improve the sign up to usage rate in, in about three and a half months by a thousand percent. Wow. And so now I go back to the same channels that scaled to $10,000, so no new creativity. So, you know, the, the reaction from the organization was, you're just not a good marketer, you know, would be the normal reaction. I went back to the exact same things that I creatively figured out the first time. They scaled to a million dollars a month. No new creativity, same, same exact things. Now they scaled to a million dollars a month, three month payback on marketing dollars invested. So we, we literally operated the business cash flow positive wow. from that moment on. The, um, you know, the, the hockey stick happened there. And then the kicker is that despite a million dollars a month being spent, 80% of new users came in through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So we had this like 4X, 5X multiplier on every dollar we were spending because we gave such an awesome value in the product for free. So we had this freemium business that they all started to tell their friends about it. And so you just had this, this machine, this growth machine that took over. And so that to me, that was like looking around, no company was operating that way where sales, marketing, engineering were pulling together and actually, or you know, product marketing and engineering pulling together to really think through that full customer journey and what are we actually trying to do and how do we measure our impact on that and focus on the things that matter. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the software, but it's uh, again, I'm mean, coming up against organizational friction and but that's, that's why you do this stuff. Like if you, if you don't take that risk on, then um, you know, no risk, no reward. So it's, it's fun doing it. And I've got, most of the companies that we sell it to now are like uh, um, NDA type companies, but you know, probably the biggest, oldest software company in, in the world is using it now. Um, one of the original big internet companies is using it now. Actually, yeah. Um, we, so we, Spotify uses it. Like we, so we've got some of these even later breakout growth companies that are using it. So I think we, we're, we're making that traction, but, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fight every day because yeah. when you sell something that literally requires people to rethink their whole organization, that's pretty hard, but um, you know, to me, it's pretty meaningful too. Yeah, especially, I mean, at that level, you're making such a huge impact if yeah. the team just decides to sway in your direction and make it change everything for them. Yeah. So one of the things I wanna uh, end off this conversation with is what are you most excited about happening in the growth world today that you think is really going to change the future for a lot of businesses? I think it's exactly what I just talked about. I mean, if, if I thought it was something else, I'd probably be working on that something else. <laughs> That's true. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I just think people can, can stop thinking that marketers do this, product people do this, engineers do this and that like just like look at the customer and look at what you're trying to accomplish and how do you pull that all together and there's there's an awesome stack of technologies for doing that but you know it's when you apply those technologies toward rapid testing good metrics tying inputs and what the team's actually doing to impact the outputs i think there's some big challenges still like i, I do think um Dollar attribution is is still a big challenge. Like you spend money a bunch across a bunch of different channels, first touch, last touch, modeling, and all of that to, to really know where you're getting that return on investment. Especially as you get bigger and more and more noise, it's hard to figure that out. Part of what we're trying to do is kind of figure out um, like attribution on what people are actually doing. So where where's the team actually spending its time? and how is that impacting growth? So that's, I think, probably even somewhat of a bigger challenge than the, than the, the, the dollar touch attribution, but that's, that's really what it's all about, is how do, you, how, do you, how do you understand the impact of the resources and redirect resources to, to the best impact, and then, and then, but also think about 
you know, what, what is preventing resources from, you know, in, deployed resources from actually making an even bigger impact. And so that's, that's where I think a lot of, you know, traditionally funnel optimization, like conversion rate optimization has kind of been hot for a while, but I think the big thing is that the theory is easy, the practice is actually really hard, and it's, it's the organizational friction that makes the practice hard. 100%. Well, I just want to give you a huge thank you for coming out and being with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. And uh, again, everybody, Sean Ellis, uh, the guy who termed growth hackers, which is you know, awesome to think about in the first place. And he is in uh, right now a building full of growth hackers who uh, get to see him uh, every single week on YouTube, Facebook, whatever it may be. And we're consuming everything you have because you are the best of the best. So, oh, well, again, thank you, Josh. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers. Yep.